This is Capital Ideas TV. Coming up, the CEO of Lexagene, getting closer to commercialization and maybe a takeout. The head of Village Farms, hitting every milestone to becoming a large producer. Generation Mining Chairman Kerry Knoll, building another winner. And first Cobalt CEO on being a go-to Cobalt supplier and refiner. Hello and welcome to Capital Ideas TV. I'm Mark Bunting. We live in the age of information where just about anything we want to know is accessible both quickly and easily. And that proclivity towards speed and convenience is not confined to the internet. It's prevalent in all sorts of services, from food service to banking and medical diagnostics. Doctors and patients alike are demanding more immediate results from medical tests, and the market is responding. Now here's a breakdown of the in vitro medical testing market, which covers diagnostics that use samples in test tubes, petri dishes, and the like. The point of care segment is the largest, with about 30% market share and 7% annual growth. Those products offer rapid test results without the need to send samples to a lab and wait days for an answer. Meanwhile, molecular diagnostics is the fastest growing, with growth of 14%. Products in that category examine the genetic makeup of samples to detect harmful pathogens and medical conditions such as cancer. Lexagene is tapping into both of those markets simultaneously. The company is developing an automated pathogen testing device called the LX6 that can test more than 20 samples at once and have results in an hour. A technician simply inserts the tests, punches in some presets on a touch screen, and hits start. The machine then breaks down the DNA and RNA in the samples and screens for up to 22 pathogens at the same time. The machine runs them through a ringer of 12 positive and two negative controls, which maximizes the accuracy of the tests. Lexagene is in the process of beta testing the LX6. It recently partnered with a veterinary company to screen samples from dogs. The idea is to make inroads in the animal diagnostics business, which is estimated to be worth more than $4 billion US. It's one of the key markets Lexagene is targeting in the coming years. CEO Dr. Jack Regan lays out what's next in the LX6 testing regime, when the product will be ready for sale, and the possibility of the company getting taken over. So, Dr. Jack, nice to see you. Let's get an update on the company and the, the LX6. I understand uh, you hit a, a bit of a milestone recently. Yeah, just this past week, we announced that our alpha prototype is uh, fully functional, and so we're very excited about that. Um, it's a big milestone for us because we've gone from taking really a concept on paper and actually building it out, and now it's a, a fully functioning instrument. Now, you've said before that uh, you have something like $40 billion worth of addressable markets here, one of them being food safety. And does this milestone that you hit recently uh, play into that? It does. I mean, we are looking at several very big markets. Uh, first, food safety, that's a $14 billion market. We're also looking at veterinary diagnostics at the $4 billion market. In addition, we have uh, a market called open access. Uh, for us, that includes you know, pharma, biotech, uh, even things like aquaculture, pathogen surveillance, things like that. Eventually, we want to get into human clinical diagnostics. That's a four, a, an $18 billion market. So what we're going to be doing uh, in the coming months is, is one with our alpha prototype. We're going to be building out really the menu of pathogens that we, that we can detect with the instrument. We're f focusing first on veterinary diagnostics, uh, so we're going to be you know, receiving in urine from dogs and cats. We're going to be testing those for urinary tract infections. We'll also be getting the samples from you know, major food suppliers looking for things like E. coli and salmonella. Now, something else that's in the news lately are uh, mosquito-borne illnesses, right. tick-borne illnesses. I saw a story about ticks just the other day on, on television. So uh, is this an area as well that you can uh, explore? It is. Um, so our open access feature is very, very unique. Right now, if you look at all the other technologies out there, they're either hard to use, requiring a highly skilled technician to actually operate the tests, or they're what we call closed access. That means that the vendor tells you what to look for. You don't have any ability to sort of customize your genetic testing. In contrast, with our platform, we can actually enable the end user to select really what pathogens they, they want to screen for. They can purchase those reagents, load them onto the instrument themselves, and do customized testing. This way, if they're interested in looking for Zika or, or, or you know, Lyme disease, they can have the instrument, look for those diseases, and get an answer in about an hour, which is extremely valuable. Right now, looking at the infectious disease market, what's extremely important is speed and ease of use, and our instrument meets both of those. 
Something else that's important for the company is you've built this more than 17,000 square foot facility just outside of Boston. What's the, uh, what's the significance of that for Lexagene? So we moved to Boston, one, because we have a tremendous uh, talent pool in the Boston area. You know, some of the, the best universities in the country are there, also a lot of other biotech companies in the industry. So you have a deep pool of uh, people or to, to grab talent from. Mm -hmm. Um, we moved outside of Boston because the cost of real estate is, of course, a little bit cheaper. We have a beautiful facility. We've built out a what's called a biosafety laboratory. This laboratory has all the engineering controls in place to allow your employees to safely work with pathogens that can cause disease. And this is important not only for our employees, but also for, obviously, the community around us. Talk about your business model because it is a bit different and go out to what you expect to be commercialization in Q2 and, and, and your sales targets and also uh, how the business model ties in with your profit margins because of these uh, sort of the razor blade model with the, uh, the cartridges. Right. So our technology really fundamentally is different. And for this reason, we really do believe it to be sort of a game changer, disruptive, whatever, however you want to call it. It's different in the sense that if you look at other technologies out there that are sort of point of care, if you will, they are um, comprised of very complex cartridges where the reagents to detect the pathogens are embedded. It makes it for a very expensive um, cartridge to actually manufacture. We, on the other hand, have a very simple cartridge, which is low cost to manufacture. And our instrument is a microfluidic instrument. It's going to be the first true, easy to use microfluidic instrument. That means it actually draws you know, fluids from these reservoirs, and those fluids are what are used to detect the pathogens. And it's actually very low cost to generate those fluid reservoirs. Because of this, our costs will be low. We'll be able to get into industries like food safety. Food safety is traditionally a very high volume, low price point per sample tested um, target uh, market. And so it's very important for us to have low costs. We can have high profit margins, even in an industry like food safety. So last time we had you on, uh, Daryl Rebeck, your president, said that uh, a takeout possibility is a very distinct possibility. Uh, so tell us about that strategy and other bigger companies that, that may want your technology. Thermo Fisher, Biorad, I mean, these are big yeah. companies in the biotech space. And importantly, those two companies, there are others, um, they really have a strong focus in the market that we are currently playing in. Uh, you know, food safety, veterinary diagnostics, just generally genomics, you know, and our instrument is a genomics instrument. And right now, they actually, neither of those companies have what we would consider to be a sample to answer technology. We offer a sample to answer technology. So these companies really, because you know, R&D and developing a product and getting it to market, there's a lot of some risk involved, and they actually wait to see a company get very close to market and they swoop in and buy. So they're no longer doing what's called organic you know, R&D investment in their own company. They wait to acquire. And so we are at the point which is a very exciting for, if you will, an early investor because we are now starting to gather the attention of some of these bigger biotech companies. We're really on the verge of generating some fantastic data. We'll be presenting at conferences. And at that point, we really do expect um, to eventually be acquired. And that's our goal, hopefully within the next year, year and a half. We feel like we're the wave of the future in terms of how people test for things. Uh, we anticipate being the first sample to answer instrument that can process up to 22 pathogens at a time. Whatever you want to test for, you can do it on your own. Uh, you don't have to ship it away to a lab. You don't have to have an expensive microbiologist. It's something you can do on site. You collect that sample, you input it into the machine, you hit a button, an hour later you get the result you're looking for. The top cannabis producers in Canada have been ramping up so rapidly, it's tough to play catch up for some of the smaller players. But Village Farms isn't phased. The company already has all the production space it needs at its fingertips and could soon vault itself into a top producer in the country. We've talked about Village Farms a number of times. It owns and operates large greenhouses across North America. It's been a low cost grower of vegetables for the past 30 years. But it's converting some of those greenhouses now into cannabis operations through a 50-50 joint venture with Emerald Health. It says cannabis can yield up to 10 to 15 times the revenue of vegetables and margins greater than 50%. Here's a look at how much it costs some of the largest cannabis growers in Canada to produce a gram of product. Afria is the lowest at $1.45, followed by Medrelief at $1.97. 
Village Farms would have both of them beat at less than a dollar per gram. Village Farms reached a key milestone when it received its cultivation license from Health Canada in March. It's now busy growing cannabis and working on acquiring its sales license in time for the summer legalization of recreational cannabis. CEO Michael DeGilio explains how that process is coming along and how he plans to become the lowest cost grower of cannabis in Canada. Michael, uh, Village Farms recently hit a pretty big milestone with, uh, with Delta 3. And I understand that by the end of August, you're looking to have about half a million square feet of, of growing capacity. So update us on, on what's happening. Okay, Mark, yeah, so currently, uh, you know, we did get our license in March and uh, went through uh, the next uh, approval from Health Canada to 110,000 square feet, which brings us to 130. Uh, we should be planted out on the first 250 by June and commence production of the second 250 uh, in August. So that would put us at 500,000 and we're on track for the full 1.1 being planted out by year end this year. Other news of note recently is that uh, along with your partner, you have a supply agreement. You're going to supply 40% uh, of their requirements. I understand you're also in talks with other licensed producers, retailers. So uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, we did an agreement with Emerald Health through the end of 19 on 40%. So on the remaining, we're in talks with uh, the purchasing agents at government, specifically in British Columbia as Pure Sun Farms. We're currently recruit recruiting in the process right now our CEO, for Pure Sun Farms, but we are also in talks with a number of uh, LPs. Uh, there's no shortage of LPs that are looking for production, so uh, we're currently in those discussions right now for a portion of the remaining uh, capacity. Now, when we first started talking to you, we know that there is a, a uh, agreement in place and options in place to, to have a lot more capacity, an extra 3.6, and then bringing it to a total of 4.8 million square feet you recently raised 10 million so give us a sense of what the timeline is and, and what that's going to cost and how you finance it well pearson farms has the option to purchase from village farms uh, the other two uh, greenhouses that are on the same footprint basically which makes it very efficient by the way having nearly five million square feet on one footprint so they're broken down 1.1 million and, and another 2.8 million square feet so uh, those agreements, the uh, right to purchase went in effect in March when Pure Sun Farms received its cultivation license. So that can happen at any time. So what we're looking at is basically the legalization of the market at this point, and uh, we're ramping up. Uh, so that could occur at any time, and we do have the capacity probably to meet one-third of the Canadian rec market just in those three facilities. And what about CapEx? How is the whole project uh, down the line financed? Well, Emerald, you know, in the original is about a $55 million conversion cost is put in the first $20 million, and then we share both of it. Uh, we have a bank who's already set to give us any debt financing we would need subject to our sales license, which we're hoping to have by, say, July, August, hopefully. And, uh, but the rest is being funded by both companies, so we're in a very good position cash-wise going forward. Now, one of the uh, companies that, uh, or one of the analysts that uh, cover you is Beacon. And let me throw some numbers at you here. They're projecting 2019 revenue of 81 million, operating costs of $1.58 a gram, net income of about 19 million, and gross margins of 62%. Do those numbers sound like they're in the ballpark? Yeah, absolutely, they sound like it. I think, uh, you know, I don't want to sit and say we can definitely beat them, but I think they're well within the ballpark. We're very comfortable with those numbers. Interesting. Now, we're looking at your stock here. Well, we've talked about it before, or, or you have more so uh, specifically, and pick a metric, but uh, generally it's, it's perceived that you're, you're undervalued. So what are your differentiators that the markets just aren't getting? Well, that's a great question. You know, I wonder it all the time, because when we look at our relative value speaking, and I mean, in the future, the metrics will come to bear when people start posting real earnings or not, not earnings, whatever, and, and uh, the measurement will be, more focused on EBITDA margins, but today, just on a relative value, I think we're the most undervalued. And typically, I wouldn't say that, but it's it's gotten to the point of frustration at times. And you know, I can't even understand it. When I look at what we've accomplished in building up this first 1.1 million square feet village farms, we haven't even hired one person. We have no burn rate. We have underlying 200 million dollar plus business that's in greenhouse production that de-risks the company. 
uh, we're going forward with a branded strategy as we move forward. And there is no value for six million square feet of, of U.S. assets in the event that the U.S. Uh, legalizes cannabis in the future. We have absolutely no value. We can move very fast in the U.S. if and when that happens. So that's a good question. Um, still trying to get the answer myself. <laughs> We're proud of the fact that we've been profitable every year since inception. If you have a business and, and you have a vision for it and you want to borrow some serious money, you have to know who your lender is. You have to trust them. What we're doing is providing the capital that enables them to realize their ambitions. Money means everything to people who don't have it. We're here. We're stable. We have 40 years now. We're looking at the next 40. You can take these guys to the bank. People in Calgary are walking with a little extra spring in their steps these days after oil prices had a good run into the low 70s before pulling back. Drillers are dusting off their rigs and workers are getting back into the field. But it's not just oil town that's smiling, molybdenum miners are smiling too. It seems like a strange connection at first, but it's true, molly and oil go together like bacon and eggs. Here's a look at the price of molybdenum in orange tracked against the price of crude. It's clear that molly goes as oil goes. That's because a third of molybdenum consumption stems from the oil and gas industry. It's found in pipelines, drilling equipment, and petrochemicals. Therefore, it's safe to assume that molly producers will continue riding high on oil's recent wave. One of the miners that should benefit from that trend is Generation Mining, a recent spin-out from Pine Point Mining. Its crown jewel is British Columbia's Davidson molybdenum deposit, where 340 million pounds of molly are thought to reside. Generation Mining believes the project could be a low-maintenance tap into 50 years' worth of the metal. Chairman Kerry Noel, who ran Pine Point before it was bought by Osisco Metals, he tells us how his team is working to get a handle on that potential and what rising molly demand will mean for its development. Kerry Remain property is a molybdenum. Davidson property in BC, which was discovered in 1944, so a long history there. What's the potential of this uh, of this mine, and, and what's the plan? Well, it's one of the largest uh, undeveloped molybdenum projects in North America. It's uh, it's high grade. It's uh, well located uh, uh, with regards to infrastructure, and um, so our our goal here, uh, the first step, is to try and figure out how much it's going to cost to mine a, a pound of molybdenum. Uh, molybdenum is trading around $12 a pound currently. Uh, as recently as two years ago, it was, it was under $5 a pound. So it's moved up. And the driver for molybdenum, uh, which is a steel alloy, tends to be the oil price. A lot of it goes into the oil field. So when oil uh, is active, uh, molybdenum is active. And uh, a lot of people think oil is going to go up from here over the next year to two years. And if that does happen, you're going to see molybdenum move up at the same time. Right. In our introduction to your interview, we did talk about that correlation between the price of, of molybdenum and, uh, and oil as well. All right. So some other properties that you have, Alberta Zinc, and I understand there's an anomaly nearby. And I also understand that there are some spending requirements as part of this deal. Yeah. The um, Alberta government, together with the federal government, uh, about 15 years ago, did a study looking for diamonds in northern Alberta. And they didn't find any, but they did find a very, very large zinc anomaly. Uh, when I say large, it's 4,000 square kilometers. It's a massive uh, amount of zinc in there. And that came from somewhere. That came from a deposit somewhere. And it's in the glacial material. So the glaciers scraped the deposit off the surface and, and, and left it in the, the zinc in the gravel. So we're trying to find the source of that zinc. And it could be very, very large. We do have a, a, a program this summer. We're going to be continuing doing more detailed sampling than the government did and hopefully pinpoint the, the, the actual source of that, and then we just drill it. All right, very good. Now, moving along to Darnley Bay, there's that name again. This is a diamond project, speaking of diamonds, in the Northwest Territories. What can you tell us about that? Well, it's, uh, it's more than just a diamond project. There are a number of uh, kimberlite uh, uh, pipes on the property that, um, that have uh, diamonds in them, but, but no, not in economic quantities. So we could look for more of those. The other thing is we're looking for a nickel uh, deposit as well. 
the geology suggests that it could have a very, very large uh, potential for a nickel deposit. So um, it's deep, um, but it, it's, it could be extremely rich. And it's, it's what the indication is, is something called gravity. Gravity is a, is a type of survey you do to, that literally measures the density of the earth. And when you're standing over top of a base metal deposit, the gravity is, is stronger. So we've got the largest gravity anomaly in the world on, on land. Um, and so that's kind of exciting. And we're hoping to be able to drill that by next summer. Let's talk some numbers here. How is Generation Mining sitting in terms of their finances? We uh, raised two and a half million dollars um, uh, in about uh, two months ago. And we're sitting on most of that. We're well funded for all of our projects uh, that we're planning to do this summer. Uh, and that includes uh, uh, additional studies on the molybdenum project to, to figure out the economics of it, to do the sampling uh, on the zinc project, and to do some further geophysics on the Darnley Bay anomaly. Now, lastly, let's look at the, the shareholdings here. You've had, you, you have solid insider ownership. The Lundin family is involved. You own more than 4% of generation mining. So if I'm an investor, which I am, but for investors who are watching this, um, what do they think about uh, your company here, Generation? You've got the main property, you've got these other properties. What should be the focus for them? What should they be thinking about your company? Well, obviously the main one is molybdenum. So watch the molybdenum price. Um, we had this same project in a company 15 years ago, and that company was worth $200 million based just on that project in a, in a, in a good molybdenum market. So should those markets return, we could see a lot of action there. But any of these other projects, a major discovery, of course, is, is a game changer. And we, we have a market capitalization of less than $5 million currently. So if we uh, drill a hole into any one of those other projects and discover something, you, you know, you can, you can really make a big difference in a big hurry. And so would you say, I mean, of course, you're the head of the company, but would you say that an investor might be wise to drop a little money in here and, and just uh, and, and maybe uh, make a bet? Well, obviously I'm biased, but of course it's 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 uh, because of the price of the of the shares is, is very low right now. It's 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 a good time to buy. I think so. Uh, probably a good time to move some money out of the cannabis stocks and into mining. Blockchain is going to be big. It's early days right now. It's much like the internet in the '90s, and we want to be in early. And we're diversifying our investments so we can sort of pick those winners and in 10 years from now, see the benefits from today's investments. We were one of the first public companies to dedicate ourselves exclusively to blockchain. We know that in five to 10 years from now, it is going to define consumer life, finance, real estate, healthcare, and we offer a good exposure into this early technology for our investors. Of all the metals in the periodic table, none is more sought after than cobalt. That's because the cool blue material is the key component in lithium ion batteries, the driving force behind electric vehicles and many other electronics. And demand is only going to intensify. Eight Capital's forecast for cobalt prices and market demand says it all. Cobalt prices have more than tripled over the past three years due to soaring demand and extremely tight supply. That imbalance is expected to become massive looking out to 2025. That should keep prices creeping higher as the supply crunch intensifies near 20,000 tons per year. The Democratic Republic of the Congo holds just over half the world's cobalt production and it isn't making it cheap for miners to access them. Clearly any company with access to cobalt in a politically stable environment could be poised for some serious upside. And first cobalt has that to a T. The company owns stakes in more than 50 historic mines and mineral sites in the Greater Cobalt Project in Northern Ontario. Earlier this year, First Cobalt completed drilling tests that unearthed impressive grades and wider mineralization zones than previously known. It's continuing its drilling program in hopes of uncovering even more potential. First Cobalt also owns one of the only refining facilities that can process materials with high levels of arsenic and other contaminants. This provides it with a potential source of reliable cash flow outside of its mining activities once it restarts the facility. First Cobalt may soon have that steady feed stock thanks to its freshly completed acquisition of U.S. Cobalt and its Iron Creek project in Idaho. The combined entity is now considered the top vertically integrated cobalt company in North America. First Cobalt CEO Trent Mell explains what's next 
for his company post-merger. So Trent, you buy U.S. Cobalt a few months ago, and we talked to the CEO of that company uh, several months ago. So what is it about that Idaho asset, and what is it about uh, the geographic footprint that you're expanding now in North America that makes this a transformative deal for you? Well, the cobalt market is really, Idaho is, is quite unique for its grade. You've got a primary cobalt asset, which is very hard to find. Usually you're getting cobalt as a byproduct, a secondary metal out of copper and nickel mines. Idaho gives you grade, it gives you primary cobalt, it's a wonderful jurisdiction, and I think there's, a, there's lots of prospectivity there that the market probably doesn't appreciate yet. I think it may surprise some investors as well that Idaho, Idaho even has uh, this kind of uh, cobalt and this grade of cobalt. So tell us more about uh, Iron Creek, what makes it, makes it uh, special? And, and you're right, uh, the, the market doesn't appreciate what's there. You know, we think of the Congo, Congo for mining, China for refining, to the exclusion of all else. And, and then you start to look at low grade, low grade cobalt content in nickel mines around the world. And Idaho has one historic asset that produced uh, the, the last century, kind of 1906, up until the 60s, if I recall. Um, owned by Glencore today, the Blackbird mine was a, was a legacy asset. But beyond that, there's a whole bunch of little showings, projects, drill results. And in the case of Iron Creek, you actually had a historic drill program, Naranda Mining Company. Then one of the biggest mining companies in the world had a historic resource estimate of 1.3 million short tons, 0.6% cobalt, which again, by global standards, is, is remarkable. And so the, the, the team uh, of U.S. Cobalt that we have now acquired uh, did a really good job of drilling that out. And when we went and looked at the, the asset, looked at the drill hole database, it seems pretty clear to me that they've not only confirmed that historic resource, but, but, but done a lot more. And so now the rush is on. We've got the team uh, is still in place on the project, and, and we've got to come up with a, a maiden historic, a maiden modern resource estimate that we can then use to keep growing that asset. But it's uh, yeah, kind of wait and see. It's going to be a lot of fun. So let's uh, talk about some numbers here. Investors would like to know the financials. So you put yourself together with, with U.S. Cobalt and go out several quarters. What, what does it look like financially? Yeah, financially, we're in good shape. We've got about $25 million Canadian in the bank. Um, that's enough to keep us busy for the next, certainly, 18 months with two very aggressive programs, uh, drilling and, and soon-to-be development, and then work at the refinery. Uh, we've got the good fortune of a really strong investor base. So we've got uh, particularly Australian institutions, Australians and Hong Kong investors who were a little bit earlier in the story as they were with lithium on the cobalt side. And so raising capital, frankly, is not a, a big challenge for us. It's trying to live up to the current market expectations. They want cobalt today and we just can't move that fast. So what keeps me up at night is how fast can we go? So milestones, uh, at the end of summer, September, we'll have our maiden resource estimate on Iron Creek. My view is we could probably do an economic assessment off of that right away, but if we have a view we can further double the resource by more drilling, we might go that route. Um, but, but again, it's to position Iron Creek as the, as the, um, as the leading asset for this company as a development uh, project. And, and with that uh, means a whole, new, a whole new team, evolution of our team to bring in project people and permitting and whatnot to, to make sure we as miners are, are not wasting time by doing everything in sequence when you can do a lot in tandem. Now, first, Cobalt has been described as a go-to multi-project Cobalt company down the road, as you're describing. So just to wrap it up here, so give us more of the investment case as to why uh, investors should, should take you guys seriously and, and maybe think about buying the stock. Yeah, in the last couple of years, about 200 Cobalt companies have popped up around the world. And, and if you were an investor looking to invest in Cobalt, going to Glencore and China Mali and, and, and players like that, the big diversifieds, it doesn't give you that exposure. So where do you go? And from the very start, I didn't take a salary when I started. I put my money in the company uh, and, and I'm, I'm there with shareholders. It was about creating shareholder value through smart acquisitions, creating scale, creating liquidity and getting the best assets. And uh, I think as you, as you see us evolve over the next year, we've got a number of milestones we will hit. We're gonna, we're gonna separate ourselves from the pack in terms of going from exploration to development. And with the key asset being the refinery, I think we're, we're well positioned to execute on that. From the heart of the Financial District in downtown Toronto, that's our show for this week. I'm Mark Bunting. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode. And for more great investment ideas through our weekly digest and morning note, subscribe to CapitalIdeasResearch.com. You can listen to our Capital Ideas radio podcast as well through iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and TuneIn. Thanks a lot for watching, and thanks for investing like a pro. We'll see you next time.